This is The Ideation Project, Season 1, Track 6. Are you scared? If the answer is yes, it's okay. There are reasons most of us are. Don't be afraid of the question. It only makes sense that agitation has come this far. It's human to not be immune, and this distress is infectious. But when did we become a world trafficking in fear? Was it always such? Are there decisions that still get made that are not based upon us being afraid? There is a global industry that now relies on fear-mongering. It is widespread and multi-headed. Elections, donations, profits, clicks, activism, TV ratings, all increasingly depend on an unhealthy dose of blowing things out of proportion. Right now, global fears may legitimately be focused on, say, North Korea. But way beyond geopolitical realities, marketers, media, world leaders, businesses, and big pharma all engage in the exploitation of alarm. Is it a stretch to say the world today is governed by fear, not love or hate or lust or greed, but fear, and fear is infectious? Here's a short list of things you may be scared of at this moment, depending on your side of the fence. Terrorism, healthcare, global warming, nuclear war, French elections, Assad, Trump, alternatives to Trump, political correctness, your belly, Berkeley and your right to free speech, the specter of our microwaves and the messages over the airwaves, fear of what we eat and fears of what we'd better not tweet. Can anyone contest that this is an age of panic? An erratic saber-rattling American president last week declared, we're not safe and regularly stokes global anxiety on all sides. Who can abide by Roosevelt with the only thing we have to fear when it seems our planet has evicted its soul? Who can minimize the fright when we feel out of control? And yet, in a lot of the cases, the fears don't match the facts. While there may be reason for distress, we also remain desperately anxious about unlikely dangers. Barry Glasner has noted in his book, The Culture of Fear, most Americans are living in the safest place at the safest time in human history. The Atlantic reported that 2015 was the best year ever for the average human being. A recent study shows that in the U.S., chances of being killed by a terrorist are infinitesimal. You're 23,000 times more likely to die from obesity. For that matter, you're more likely to drown in your bathtub. Focus can be skewed. Road crashes seldom factor in decisions around travel the way concerns about terrorism or homicides do, both of which are less of a threat than getting behind the wheel is for you. Partly, fear is the necessary outcome of the construction of enemies. Listen to enough right-wing talk radio and you may emerge with desperate anxieties about our future. Anti-immigrant alarmism alone has led to all kinds of social and political movements around the world. But then so is the response. Some on the progressive left will convince you the planet is headed for annihilation, if the environment even holds out that long. But wait, climate change is real. The rotation of this agitation is confusing. Maybe all bets are now supersized. Surely this is the moment when our horrors are being realized. And yet even with North Korea, how are average citizens supposed to know the risk? How do we determine if we're on the precipice of a new nuclear fog, or if this is just another example of wag the dog? Dan Gardner wrote in The Science of Fear, a little more attention to history would reveal that there have always been people crying doom, almost none of whom turned out to have any more ability to see into the future than the three blind mice of nursery rhyme fame. But our brains are also hardwired to fear first, think second, and fear is infectious. Now our ability to make determinations is further clouded by a 24-7 news cycle that is more fueled by likes and clicks than by getting the facts correct. In short, how do we really know how scared we should be? Surely one of the answers to an age of fear is in each of us taking personal responsibility to educate ourselves and manage our own worries. But if information is the crucial piece, who are we to trust in what we see and hear? Who are the best sources when communication industries benefit from an exploitation of fear? Scaring people is a tool, it's also crippling. The prescriptions for pulling ourselves out of a distress vortex are the ultimate challenge. But in the meantime, we ought to recognize that we cannot build a collective functioning world based on reacting to anxiety and alarm alone. There has to be a way to change the tone. The prospect of failing to do that is terrifying. <laughs>